And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Geek Watch, a subsidiary of the monastery, the open bar of the internet. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two of my good brothers here in the temple. We have the man guiding you through all of your VTubers and taking over your, an your anime with determination. Good brother Shades. And we have, and we have the man who, and we have the man who has a hole in his heart bigger, bigger than met, bigger than Metaton. Good brother Xanatrix. We are, ba we are back once again with, a, with a little, so a little something before, before, Ma before Merry Luda Christmas. <laughs> mm. um, and bef and before the and before the set the first part of International Hangover Day, also known as Christmas Day. Because let's be honest, th let's be honest. There's gonna be somebody who's gonna talk, who's gonna talk people into drinking eggnog. I certainly am not gonna, and I'm pretty sure neither of you are. Yeah. So funny enough, I actually had uh, store bought eggnog earlier today. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I've never been a fan of eggnog, and um, there are certain people in my family who swear that it swear that it's not that bad. And my, I think if it's homemade, it could be it could be good, but just store bought stuff just tastes like shit. Store bought oh. is gross. I've only ever liked homemade, and the uh, homemade stuff that comes from my family is non-alcoholic and made with orange rather than rum. That doesn't sound that bad, actually. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's pretty good. Yeah. Although it took it took it took me a it took me a while to even even stomach rum. I think I think it's something something about how it goes down just doesn't sit with me. It was a acquired taste. Although I will say I will say this shades I will take eggnog over over trying to take um, apple pie again. <laughs> <laughs> You will never live that down, will you? Yes, I like a little bit of I like a little bit of drink in my fucking cinnamon. <laughs> for context, for those, yeah, yeah. For context, when we were when we hung out at MetroCon a couple years ago, uh, one of our friends who we call we lovingly call Metro Kitty, she's a bartender, so she tends to bring a whole cooler full of alcohol with her, and she knows how to mix some stuff up. And one year she made what was she called an apple pie. Basically, it was like an apple sour with cinnamon and a lot of and a few other things in there. And uh, whoa, boy! <laughs> I didn't know there were other things in there. I just I just felt cinnamon. Yeah. The only thing I know of is apple pie is actually a um a brandy that one of my uh, mother's friends makes homemade, and it really does taste like warm apple pie. So. Yeah, it's really good. <laughs> anyway, we're getting up, we're on the rails. Yeah, we're on the rails, but tra but transitions are weird because there was a there was a certain there was, there are certain mantras that we have here in the temple, as one would expect in any in any temple. And one of these days, I may I may I may write them out on a t I may write them out on a T-shirt like that House of Black T-shirt that just dropped. Um, which is a, ca a case of big a case of big ass foreshadowing AEW. <laughs> and yes, I, yes, I'm a bit biased because I like Malachi Black. Um, although how, although how could you not? Mm -hmm. But the th but within within those there was one that that um I that I recently that I recently coined that I wanted to explore but I didn't have the right angle. Until Shades posited, we bring that up along with along with something else that we that we had wanted to talk about for a while, which brings which brings me to this to this week's topic: Undertale and the Curse of Fandom. And since this is since this is in your bag, and since you're the one who kind of talked me into this idea, <laughs> Shades, would you mind would you mind help setting the stage? I'll have some things to say about Undertale compared to a different game that's. That's drawing upon similar inspirations, but I want to I want to set the stage first. Absolutely, my friend. So, now for those of you who, for the very few of you who have not at least heard of Undertale, and which if you're on the internet, how did you not five years ago when God damn it, it was fucking everywhere? Mm -hmm. 
The game, the game followed a young child who fell into a mysterious room and where monsters had been sealed away after a great war many, many, many years ago. And your objective was to get out of this cave, either by escaping on your own, or if you really wanted to be the friendliest of friendly people, freeing the monsters through the power of pacifism and determination. Trust me, that word is a thing you'll be hearing a ton if you ever play this game. Now... When this came out, obviously it had blown up. In fact, it blew up bigger than even its own creator, Toby Fox, had ever imagined it was going to. He had started out doing some music for stuff like Homestuck and also had become quite uh, well known for a uh, Earthbound uh, hack that he had done, like a Halloween, uh, Earthbound Halloween edition. Mm -hmm. But this was his first full project and had put out a very, very light Kickstarter. I mean, we're only talking, he only wanted about $5,000. You know, for a video game, that's small. He ended up getting ten times that by the end. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure he's gone... He, he's added a few more zeros to that number in terms of how much revenue he's gained based on how much merch and uh, copies of the game, how many different versions of the game have come out since then. Mm -hmm. And now we've got the sequel, Deltarune, that's starting to come out now. We're already on Chapter 2 of that. Mm -hmm. But where this ties into today's topic is... How big the fan base for Undertale blew the fuck up, and more importantly, what they did in taking this simple setup and expanding upon it and twisting it in so many ways that it's almost scary. Mm -hmm. Because how this happened was that it started out, and I actually want to set the start getting. We're going to start by diving a little bit into the AU verse, mm -hmm. because this is this. You need to understand how dedicated this fan base got before we really dive into the curse this created and how this also applies to so many other fan fan bases and fandoms out there. It started when a person a uh, person by the name of Vic the Underfella decided he wanted to twist play it put a little twist on the story what would happen if the monsters instead of just being the normal everyday kind of people they're just living their lives what if instead they let the, the madness get to them and they ended up becoming this vicious aggressive group of monsters where all of them are just assholes thus underfell and of course because the game the, the fan base had was currently at its peak at this point it blew the fuck up as well, with people creating their own versions of all the characters, and there's even a fan game of this. Like, there's a full-on Underfell fan game out there on Game Jolt. Mm -hmm. And this alone would have been bad, fun enough, but then, at the same time this was going on, another person by the name of Popcorn Prince also decided, hey, you know, what if we were to take Sans and Papyrus and switch out their personalities? So now... Sans is the royal guard in training with the with all the ambition in the world and a lot of uh, lacking in uh, sense. And Papyrus was the lackadacious blazy bones who j who uh, had, could see the timelines and basically was you know aware of everything. Mm -hmm. So and that also blew up from there, creating. Underswap, where all of the cast basically got swapped around. Mm -hmm. Hell, you played as Kara instead of Frisk. <laughs> and if you're gonna complain about me spoiling the fact that the uh, spoiling Frisk game, come on, it's f it's almost six years now since the game came out. I think we're past that point. Statute's passed. <laughs> Statute has passed. So, but and that and from there, the snowball happened. Because there are, just just by looking at the splash screen I created for this, you can see there are so many AUs. And and this, and and then, and adding to that all of the post-game, pre-game, mid-game stories that people decided to tell. And the reason for this, and this was something I was, ta I was talking to uh, Kier Crystal about before the show. The reason this happened is because a lot of Undertale's story, a lot of the things that happened outside of the main story is left very vague. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't know what life was like on the uh, with, mon with the monsters before the war. Or, oh, we don't even know what the war really ha looked like or what, what the spell was or what it did. We don't know about all of the things that happened in the underground before 
Frisk arrives. You know, we know a little bit, obviously, with Kara and their involvement, but everything outside of that, we know very little. Uh, and, of course, what happened after they got out of the underground? Like, what, what happened after any of the endings? What happens after a pacifist ending where the monsters are free? What happens after a neutral ending if Frisk escapes on their own? Or how about what happens after a genocide ending? So much... In to, to show you how deep, how the vagueness of the story created so much, a character that most people didn't even know was in the game has exploded into numerous stories and tales in the form of Wingding Gaster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if 90% of people who played hands. this game probably didn't even know he was there because it is a random chance if he'll even appear in your entire playthrough. And it's only one door in one room. Basically, yeah. There's this one door in Waterfall that has a 10% chance of appearing. And even if you do get that door, there's a 10% chance that the mystery man will even be in there. <laughs> so it's like a soup. It is rare upon rare if you even saw this guy. And yet somehow people were able to learn about him and exploded it into a full backstory of him being the former royal scientist falling into the void which you know this was stuff that was covered in the game again in very rare circumstances that you could find it and they just took that and fucking ran with it mm -hmm. that is how crazy this shit got in fact i've been i've been look working on possibly doing a soapbox for this in the near future explaining them like all the different au's and what some recommendations on some stuff you could check out later so i won't Waste uh, your time here. <laughs> if you end, if you end up doing that, I think I think you should call it exploring the Undertale iceberg. You know what? That might actually not be a bad idea. <laughs> you know, see if see if you can see if you can shop see if you can shop together your avatar with a um with an ice pick or something. <laughs> I could probably do it. I probably could do it mm -hmm. anyway. But the 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 whole point we're getting uh, the the thing we're leading to with this is that with a fan base that that is that massive that rabid. And that dedicated to something like this, mm -hmm. inevitably, their ten problems can arise. Yeah, as I uh, one of one of my unwritten laws is that as as a as a movement as a movement gains size and gains traction, the probability of in of individ of individuals showing up who want to make it out who want to make it all about them becomes one yes i yes i am somewhat cribbing from godwin's law but it still applies and this is this is because one one particular um one particular avenue that i've been i've been discussing and meditating about Yes, meditating, not napping. There is a difference. <laughs> See, even I can reverse memes. Is the is um is the factors that ma that make a fandom toxic. And I'm referring to actual toxicity, not the wah someone so, some someone was mean to me because I had a bad take. I e I e the I e the kind of quote unquote toxicity that is that a certain Taldere artist ended up kicking the hornet's nest about last night, but I'm ref I'm referring to to more to to active host active hostility, and there's a couple there's a couple fandoms that are that that are that are on a similar vein when it comes to that. I know an easy one to go with is the Steven Un is the Steven Universe fandom, which we are not doing a Geek Watch episode on Steven Universe. Oh, ever. <laughs> there, there, uh, it, it, not just because of the ser because of that uh, of the obvious reasons, but also there's really not much for us to talk about with that. And as far as talking about how la how later arcs of it s ended up sucking ass, um, there's already there's already a bunch there's already a bunch of people who's done it. Hell, Miss Anthropony did a did like did like a two hour rundown of ha of just going into ha just going to the rise and fall of the whole series um i will ad i will admit that no mutants allowed is one of the more infamous cases of toxicity in my personal experience that almost caused nah. Fallout three to not happen ish oh 
and for the for the longest time they were my go to when it came to when it came to toxicity. But I now um it could it could e an easy write off would be would be to say that a lot of this is just due to the kind of audience that Tumblr would cultivate. But to me that feels a little too easy. For one, it's not just Tumblr, though Tumblr certainly was prevalent with this problem. Mm -hmm. But as time has gone on, it's just been social media in general. But the point I think you're trying to get at is that, honestly, these people have always existed. It's just that the internet has kind of allowed these people to congregate, fester, and grow. Yeah. There... Because we, because even in even in my own even in my own area of expertise, we have we have this kind of issue, uh, whether whether it be whether it be the um the more t the more to the more toxic the, the more toxic um Watsi apologists, also or d who some of whom some of whom have critical have critical role fan in their bio. I. .e. I.e., all they all they know it all they know of D and D is fr is from that show, which doesn't exactly help matters. Nope. Or the uh, or in the old fashioned case, you have the Grogs, who I take the piss out of in all I've taken the piss out of in like three out of the four reviews that I've that I've done over the past three months. <laughs> Monk, your existence takes the piss out of the Grog. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> My existence takes the piss out of a lot of people. Um. Uh, Grog's including yourself <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh. but to add to that to add to that you, you there's not i think there's only like a wonder there's a very few if any communities that don't have this kind of toxicity hell me being the anime guy i know for a fact there are numerous fan bases that can get really bad hell i have made i have made it no secret that i'm a big fan of haruhi suzumiya but Good God, do not get, do not even come close to dabbling with the Haruhiism movement, because good Jesus Christ, these people can go crazy. You yeah. know what's ironic about all of that? I don't see that amongst the Berserk fandom, considering how insane that manga is. I'd say, I'd say, I'd say we do, we don't see, we don't see it often with with Berserk. I do think, I do think that. A big, I do think that a contributing factor to that case is the fact that Berserk is not Berserk is significantly trickier to get into compared to um, compared to something like Haruhi. No, I no think offense, the other no half. Offense, sh no offense, shades, but it's the case. Not taken. The I think the other half of that fact is that is that Berserk by itself is already dark, insane, and and uh, just outrageous enough. People don't need to add to it. Yeah, pretty much. I'd say, and the few, and the few who try always get stomped down by the rest of the people around them. I'd say, I'd say one, other, I'd say one other, is the fact that I don't, I don't see a whole lot of toxicity issues going on in the BattleTech community, and the the um a lot of, the a fair amount of the subreddits. If if someone even sniffs at trying to bring up. Certain dr certain dramas, like when someone tried to, someone tried to, um, someone tried to bring us some shit about Arch, that got shot down quick. Yeah, and we brought up in the past how the VTuber community has tried to avoid c such toxicity. I mean, you can't avoid drama. The recent Vishojo situation has kind of proven that, but. A lot of the VTuber community has tried to not allow toxic people in their groups. If someone tries to act like an asshole in a someone's stream, they get shut down hard. Mm -hmm. Self-policing is a big, a big piece and, of uh, of good fan bases. And and I'm using fan bases specifically. And since we're since we're bringing that kind of thing up, just remember, folks, don't trust China. China is asshole. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and, Taiwan and, is a real country. <laughs> yes, we will stand by that. Fuck you, China. Anyway, don't so you mean, don't you mean Taiwan? Don't mean, West? Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say fuck you, West <laughs> Taiwan. <laughs> anyway, so to bring this back around to the Undertale fandom, mm -hmm. the 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 toxicity in that group is insane. Because, for example, at uh, an old buddy of ours, Matt Pat. I'm sure some of you've heard of him. <laughs> years buddy ago, strong word. 
Well, hey, we actually used to work with a guy. I I know, but buddy is still a strong word. <laughs> That's why I say old buddy. We don't talk much anymore. Anyway, anyway, point being, years years ago, he did a video jokingly throwing out the theory that Sands was Ness from from Earthbound. Now again. He clearly did never meant to take this that seriously. This was just for fun. But good fucking Christ, the amount of hate he got for that video. And then a little while later, he did this awesome thing where he was selected to meet the Pope. And they were asked to bring a gift for his holiness. And given that this was a whole about peace and love and everything else, Matt chose to give him a copy of Undertale. He knew that he knew the Pope wasn't going to play Undertale, but it was just the, the symbolism of it, you know, the, the gesture itself. I'm going to laugh. He got shit up for that. And <clears throat> you know, I hate to say it this way. Well, I don't really. Uh, <laughs> the Undertale fandom, uh -huh, and that's ending in B, guys. Um, doesn't self-police almost at no. all. In fact, if it, it, all of their self-policing is in the wrong direction, yeah, you try to you try to keep toxic people out, you get stomped down. That's just their OC. That's their head cannon. Leave them alone. That's, and it's like yeah, yeah. That's um. There, I've I can't I can't help but notice that within within more toxic um, communities. And this doesn't apply to No Mutants Allowed, but it certainly applies to some of the other egregious examples. Is is for, first off, a degree a degree of attachment and an unwill an unwillingness to 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 um to 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 rein in um individuals' excesses, and especially the the whole notion of everyone's OC being being equally valid. As much oh. as as nice as that is, as nice of a gesture as that is, sometimes there are some times when some when somebody's OC is inevitably going to cross the line, and they have to be called out for that kind of thing. Otherwise, you otherwise you have to ask the uncomfortable question of does that does that mean that my immortal is valid? This is the reason why I don't <laughs> like the Thermian argument. Exactly. And I definitely and... don't like death of the author. Ugh! Fuck that noise. But. That I think part of the reason why the Undertale fandom has done this is the fact that because of the many timelines that this series, that this game has, the idea that you could go from different timelines, it has created this idea that any timeline could be valid. I'm not defending this. I think that's a dumb argument, but I can see where people are getting this idea from. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, to be fair... A that. lot of that has worked out really well. Again, yeah. a lot of these AUs are good, and a lot of the content that's come from this idea has been really good. One of my favorite uh, things was a Tumblr thing called Ask Friskin Company that mm -hmm. one particular YouTube group fan dubbed, and I may have contributed some at voices of the askers here and there. You know, <laughs> a little bias, yourself. I'll admit. A little bias, I'll admit. But... It was a legit good series, you know, It and it tried to keep everything in continuity, and the shipping that did happen there does make sense within the series. Alphas and Undyne get hooked up. I mean, that was an obvious one. Sans and Toriel. I mean, did you see? Did you hear what Sans was saying about the him knocking on, joking with the ruins? You know? The, the only one that's a bit of a stretch is Papyrus and Metaton. And even that's not... Even then, you know, you could kind of see it, <laughs> you know? I mean, only because neither of them actually know what dating is, and it's just going to be the best bromance ever. <laughs> no, they go full ship with it. Like, they oh, don't. Shit. Like I said, it's a stretch. I'm not even defending it. Yeah, I'm just yeah. saying that's the only one that's a stretch. The other ones are perfectly valid, you know? Or for the most part, are valid. There's also a thing with Frisk and Monster Kid, <laughs> mm -hmm. but what? the point is, is that hey, that that but that's the thing with the way this game was set up, the way the story of the game was done. There it could very well be a timeline where that shit makes sense. We will never know, and thus it is open for everyone to throw in their own interpretations. 
Now, if managed correctly, this can lead to some creative shit, and it has. But... The problem happens is that a lot of people will inevitably take it too far, and there are some AUs out there that, oh god, do I need to bring up Underlust? Let's Stop. not say we didn't. <laughs> Stop. Yeah. S-T-A-H-P. Oh, uh, oh, I could do worse. I'm sure you've heard of Undertale, T-A-I-L. Yeah, but that's just R34 at that point. <clears throat> you know what? Fair, 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 fair. Now, yeah, I think I think the biggest the biggest underlying uh, crux to all of this that may have lended itself to certain fandoms that we've mentioned being as toxic as they are is an unwillingness to take any form of criticism. Mm -hmm. criticism is seen as inherently toxic whether it's constructive or not mm -hmm. you have to be supportive all the time regardless of how good or bad the product is and i'm going to say it this this stems from tumblr this outright stems from tumblr and the, and the mindset of tumblrites it's this idea that if you try to tell someone how to fix or improve their work, that you are messing with their artistic vision, which obviously is bullshit. You know, we're, you know, one, we're not actually telling you how to do your job, how to do your work. We're telling you how you can make it better. And two, that kind of mentality of, I know what I'm doing. Don't try to tell me how I do my, do, how to do make my work just creates this idea that you're just you know you're you know better than everyone this kind of superiority complex that can just spiral out of control if you're not careful it also stunts growth and the opportunity to change and evolve as a person there are people i personally know from my real life uh people i knew in middle school who could never take criticism in any form on whatever they were they were doing whether it was a kid who programmed or one who drew, one who wrote, etc. They have not changed their method or the quality of their work since then. Their yeah. drawings or whatever look the same as they did then. And I go, we tried to help you. We tried to give you some, some hey, that looks cool here. Looks like you could use a little work there. And you flipped out. Yeah. To, in contrast. Since my wife, Lady K, just came home, actually. She is an artist and an author. She draws all the time, and she's currently writing her own books. She actually does take feedback from other fellow authors and artists. And because she's willing to take that criticism and take it earnestly, I have seen her art evolve and improve so much since we started going out since before we got married. And it is amazing the kind of stuff she can draw these days. And her book, holy crap. Even though I have never fully read it, read it, for what little she's been able to tell me, it is very clear that she has been able to make it a, something that's going to be fun to read once it's finally done. That is what constructive criticism is about. You have to be willing to say, I know I can do better. What can I improve? Oh, this? Let's fix it. I feel, of course. I feel like a good parallel that Zan, that Zan and I can bring up in that regard is our relationship with Tanner. Yes, absolutely. I do want to make one last point about constructive criticism before we move forward on that. Mm -hmm. It does rely on the uh, foundation that the criticism being offered is honest, earnest, and not malicious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't have an obligation to take legitimately malicious critique. When someone yeah. says, your art fucking sucks, go off yourself, that is not a critique you should listen to. Yeah, don't, you don't have to listen to that shit. But if someone says, hey, you know what, this is good, but maybe if you did this, it'd be even better. If someone says that, you might want to at least listen. Even if you don't actually take that advice, if you at least say, okay, you know, but I want to do it this way because this, this, and this, but I will consider that for the future, then... You're doing it right. Yeah. Um, there's a couple. There's a couple. Par there's a couple parallels that I want that I want to bring up on that regard. One of them is um, the self-proclaimed asshole 
Todd McFarlane. That's not, <laughs> I've, oh, on his, I believe he did this on his Facebook a few years back. He posted, a, he posted about over, I'd say about two, at least 200 rejection letters that he had gotten from the bit from the big two when he was trying to break into the industry. A few that he specifically pointed out that as as being helpful to him were from Jim Shooter. The le- the legend the legendary fa- face in in the go- in um in Marvel in, during Marvel Comics' is, is, um breakout run in the 70s and the and the guy who's responsible for the Weapon X storyline. Mhm. Along, along with a whole lot of other things, it's and be, least of which being one of the co one of the co-founders of Valiant. But there's a big long et al at, at the end of his uh his uh, his resume that we are just leaving out <laughs> because yeah. you can go read on that yourself. Yeah. But but shooter had but shooter had get had given him critique on had given him honest critique on his art. And and supplied a how-to guide on how to implement those those critiques, and and McFarland had said had said that those partic- those particular um, responses, as well as others that were on a similar vein, were instrumental in helping him get better. Uh, and the other the other analog that I was going to bring up is. Our relationship with Tanner concerning concerning heavens and heresies. Yeah, um, <laughs> Tanner gives us feedback on every episode. Has since episode one. Um, we offer some sort of constructive critique, and he'll either go, "That's a good idea. I'll implement it," or he'll give us a response of, "That doesn't gel with the rest of what I have in mind." And we keep in mind that it, this is an alpha document. This is this is not a complete a complete uh, product by any means. Mm-hmm. And there are going to be things we just don't know about because he either hasn't transferred them from playtest notes to the actual documents, or just hasn't hammered them all out yet. Mm-hmm. But I will always remember the first big piece of feedback that was personally because of me was reviewing the Barbarian. I said the Barbarian feels like Guts from Berserk, just without armor. And after he watches the episode, he comes back and says in his notes, Yeah, you're right. That is, that is a character fantasy some people will want to, uh, will want to, to fill out. An armored uh, Barbarian, a la Guts. And uh, he literally shifted basically half the class to have different perks if you're using armor. Mm-hmm. It was... blew my fucking mind. I was like, the fuck? <laughs> People the, listen? I think the reason it blew your mind is because we had just gotten off of being so pissed off with the Level Up project at the, at the time. Monk, I almost can't remember being angry anymore. Heavens and Heresies has just been that good. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm gonna have to, when I do when I do the summary. I'm gonna have to call back some of that some of that anger. Oh boy. Well, we'll both uh, we'll both be in good company. Yeah. But there's there's been there's been a hand there's been a there's been a handful of times where, um, where I've got I've gotten I've gotten responses for some for some of the reviews some, for some that for some obviously they couldn't implement it. Other others didn't others didn't take it as well. But, th- but um, there's but there's never been there's never been that much of a cro- of a cross word, between um, between mo- between most of the people that I've co- that I've covered. Um, mm-hmm. But the thi- and the thing the thing it the thing is, I think I think that ev- I think that Tanner is at I think the key difference is that. Tanner is as uh, is as attached to his particular project since it is a one man jo- is largely a one man show, as se- as plenty of people's a- AUs or or the like. The different the difference is, the attachment doesn't go so far as as um, as the common trap of if you're criticizing the work then you're criticizing that person personally. 
yeah, he can he can actually look at the criticisms we levy and go, yeah, that that doesn't, you know, that fits something that people may want to play. So I should probably change it so it's implemented a little yeah. better. If you or, want to see somebody in the tabletop realm who doesn't take criticism, Kevin Ciambeda. <laughs> I'm not laughing for any reason, none at all. <laughs> now, yes, I I know I know that I br I know that I bring up riffs and and the like a lot, and it's my and it's one of my and it's been my whipping boy since day one. But that is because uh, while I've while I've never had any interactions with him personally, I have ha I have had plenty of stories relayed to me about him from from my contacts. And one, a lot of other people in the industry don't care for him. And two, he um, he has he has this he's he's notorious for having this idea of no of knowing best when it comes to when it comes to the direction of any Palladium product, and having to put his spin on it to the point where I I did call him I did call him the um, tabletop version of Vince McMahon at one point. And Vince McMahon is another good point of someone who doesn't take criticism, but we've already hammered on him ad nauseum in other episodes. Yeah, but the key, <clears throat> the key thing, the key thing with the, with a lot of the with a lot of the more toxic, um, a lot of the more toxic AU folks is is that particular fact. And I'd say I'd say another I'd say I'd say it's the I say it's the fact that a lot of the, a lot of the people who 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 are attached but want but want to want to have their particular work be the best that they can will will do will do that um another another really pro another really prominent example i can th i can think of would be and this is something i wanted this is something i wanted to bring up as a nice bit of contrast who here had to suffer through even even watching playthroughs of Yik, a postmodern RPG. Me. Boy, did that look like the fucking plague. Uh, this was I, this was this was also the guy who his last gasp was cl was claiming that was claiming that video games are not art; they're ju they're just children's toys. And he tried he tried to make this complaint on the Dick Show. Not exactly the best place if you want if you want if you're looking for sympathy. Just saying. No simpy, but that fucking travesty, the monstrosity that he made. Um, I recently saw I recently saw a, a um very, a very good a very well done review um overview of it that said that it that it feels like a it feels like a game if it, it feels like a as much as I hate to use this word JRPG from from an in, by as made by an internet troll who hate who who hates JRPGs in the style that in the style that they were strawmanned during the seventh generation. We all remember those days. Mm. I choose not to, Monk. That memory can shove right the fuck off. I will enjoy my games. I keep I keep I keep that memory around not because I not because I long for those days, but be but because as as um. As Sun Tzu had said, "Know your enemy. If you know your enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles." Yes, but but the but um the the point is is that he he did he he had he had made this he had made this song and dance about wanting to make a wanting to make this postmodernist game, and when and when he got pushback instead of instead of learning from that pushback for what for what would come later. He doubled down. I think the worst part is that his postmodernist game actually in in the smallest amounts legitimizes some of the buzzwords used by the eternally offended. Yeah. Like when your main character is surrounded by a by a bunch of women and treats them all almost quite literally as objects, um, this is this is not me buzzwording to buzzword. This is me buzzwording because the game legitimately uh, gives justification. 
to the idea of quote unquote male gaze. Uh, I cringe saying that. Ah! Yeah. The, the fact that he could set things back so far by making a game so bad pisses me off. Mm-hmm. I hate that he legitimized Simone de Beauvoir. I hate it. <laughs> However, the the reason that the reason that I br- the reason that I bring I bring the, I bring it up in com- in comparison is as as I mentioned as I mentioned before with a, with a lot of a lot of the people who act in ba- who act in bad faith about their about their OCs or their one true pairing the the cr- the crime that they end up making is the crime of attachment. Um, and I I real I am fully aware of the irony of 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 me the monk talking about attachment but there is, but there is a po- but there is a point to that some when you when you have that level of attachment again it's it's impossible to separate critique of the of the item to criti- to critique of the person and when someone's critique in that in that personal way they have they have, unless unless they have that level of humility they um they end up la- they end up lashing out inevitably and unfor- and um if the and when that can when that kind of attitude is is um cu- is cultivated by, by by benign defense that's when you end up having the problem and i'd i can't help but wonder if the if the reason why it, the reason why that benign defense happened is people being sold on the utopia this is something i talked about a few days ago Oh, the short version is this idea. This idea that because of the, because of the fact that that it's all, that it's all for some sort of uto- some sort of utopia, um, that if the, that if there is a pr- if if you're noticing a problem, you're the one with the you're the one with the actual problem. You're no, you're just not seeing things correctly. Essentially, you're denying your experience. Um, Lewis Rossman did a video on this a few years ago when it came to the cult of Apple. Mm-hmm. Though that whole uh, that whole thing of of oh their their OC their their um their AU is ju- is just as is just as valid as it, as any others, um, I can't help but look at that as a d- as denying the experience. It's also a crutch. Oh, it def- yeah. oh it definitely is. But denying the re- deny but. But a to- I'd say a toxic gr- I'd say a toxic group will always try and deny the experience for for the promised one, and the utopia in this case doesn't have to be utopia in the political sense or anything like that, but more the prompt. But I'd say in this case the promise of the utopia is that is that possibility of all these AUs being just as valid. It's the promise of the ideal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and I th- I think I think when it comes to that, um, Sturgeon's Sturgeon's law is applicable. Anything, oh, can, be art. Art. Anything can be art, but ninety percent of art is crap. And that definitely applies to the Undertale AU verse. There are some amazing AUs out there. Underfell and Underswap are great. Epic Tale, again, Ask Frisk and Company were great. Hell, if you really want something spooky, Horror Tale is pretty good, too. And I but love the, the hell out of Glitch Tale. Oh, Glitch Tale is so fucking good. Yeah, Glitch Tale and Cross Tale and all those are really good stuff. Some amazing art has been made for those. But the further you dive in, the more you start to see the shit that comes out of there. Again, you look at the aforementioned Underlust mm-hmm. and a couple of the other more popular AUs. There's some weird fucking stuff. The, if you want to know how bad the Undertale... AU versus there's an entire wiki strictly dedicated to all the different AUs that are out there. I'm on that wiki. I was about to say I'm fluttering that right now. <laughs> you and me both, sir. There, as, <laughs> there's as an, as an aside, I can't help but laugh at how at how fl- at how Flutter's name has become a pejorative. <laughs> I mean, it's but it's an affable and friendly pejorative. Come on now. This isn't like a slur in the sense of we hate Flutter. We love no, we're, Flutter. It's we're just... not. We're not Hassan Piker. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
You're being a flutter. <laughs> oh, now we're canceled. <laughs> right, canceled. If you listen, it's close, impossible you can hear... to cancel the monastery. If you listen, if you listen close, you can hear Flutter sneezing in the background. Oh. Is, th is that what I hear? <laughs> but this, not only is there an AU wiki, there's then another AU wiki just for the OCs, the OC wiki. Oh yeah, fanon wiki. Well, it's under tailoc.fandom.com slash wiki. Yeah. There's yeah. and then of course there's wikis for each individual big name uh wi cross wiki like Undertale Row, Undertale Chronicle, Cross Tail, Undertale Yellow. As an as an aside, with all of, with all of these o AUs and all and all this stuff in in the fandom I'm honestly disappointed that no, that nobody's tried to tackle tabletop adaptations yet. I have no plans on doing it anytime soon, but it's it's kind of amusing that nobody's crossed that bridge yet because well, um, Pokemon's done it like three times. Um, there is a TTRPG based on the atmosphere, tone, and ridiculousness of Undertale. Its name is Dial Tone. Fair point. And then, of course, on Reddit, we have Under Roll, the role top, the role playing tabletop system on the Undertale r slash Undertale subreddit. Okay, so okay, so there are a few people who've taken a crack at it, which I figured, yeah. I, figured in, I figured would be inevitable. Maybe I'll maybe I'll look at them one of these days. I don't feel like doing that tonight. Uh, I think that's uh, a little bit beyond our bailiwick right now, at least yeah. with this geek watch. Yeah, but I'd and I'd I'd say um I'd say another an, another ca another case of that whole that whole that whole not that whole denying the ex denying one's experience is is something is something we've seen plenty of times in more toxic ends of people um people having the, having this mandate as as if as if the interpretation that they have is more correct this this is kind of where kind of where death of the author kind of sneaks in mm -hmm. and as we, as we stated we we do not ca we do not care for death of the author and well i'd like to be a little more specific mm -hmm. There are certain cases where using death of the author as a thought experiment is warranted and fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if Broad you're doing brushes. It, just, <laughs> if you're doing it as a what if, sure, have fun with it. Mm -hmm. But if you if otherwise if you're not if that's not where you're going, you're offering up a head cannon. And Monk, what do we do with head cannons? Head cannons. <laughs> Get the head cannon. And uh, death of the author applied in any other fashion is um, what's the word? Cultural Marxism. It actually is by definition. It's just like getting rid of the bourgeois. Um, <laughs> death of the author is it basically says it doesn't matter what the intention of the creator of thing was when creating thing the experience pulled by someone outside of that creation process is equally as valid as the intention of the creator which is so hilariously vapid and shallow of a statement as possible while also being super fucking wrong yeah. I, I, I anyone who knows who has followed us down here knows I have a personal tale with somebody trying to use Death of the Author for a certain review they did, and yeah, it was as dumb then as it is now. Mm -hmm. And especially since, what with very rare exception, I find that most people who throw in Death of the Author or the Thermian argument that was that was a royal pain in the ass for a few years. Mm -hmm. um, Almost always do so in bad faith. Use oh, so there's Jean Paul Sartre. Now, yeah, first we invoked uh, first we invoked De Beauvoir. Now we're invoking Sartre. Great. 
Yeah, they're basically trying to use the arg the Thermian argument and Death of the Offer to justify whatever agenda they want to project onto the story. Mm -hmm. Now, even if it doesn't actually exist there. An example an example of an example of this when it came to when it came to the, when it came to um the 40k universe has been has been one line that that so, that certain people not as fam, not as familiar with the 41st millennium have tried to argue for years. That being why there aren't any female space marines. And the and um they end up using they end up using either those either those arguments in response because the reason has been largely largely consistent for the past 40 years. The gene seed used to create space marines came from the emperor. The god emperor of the god emperor of man is male. Thus, tr thus it thus trying to trying to put that trying to put that in and mix that into female DNA is go is going to have compatibility issues and it's not going to work. Especially especially some of the latter ones like the black carapace. <laughs> uh, which invo which involve which involves putting that thing right under the skin, which means you have to take the skin off. Yeah, the process to make the process to make one space marine is not something that you would wish on anyone. <laughs> uh -huh. But the but the argument has been the argument has been cons has been consistent, and the and. While the, while there are while there is room for while there is room to ma to make it to make your own particular batch of say space marines or Imper or imperial guard regiments or and so on there are still there are still things that you have to fall in with other otherwise it otherwise it goes completely into the realm of fan fiction and that and that's one of the, that's one of those putting the foot down mo putting the foot down moments that some people aren't willing to accept uh, more recent more recently there's been the there's been the whole issue with some of the lore with some of the really pants on head stupid lore changes that wizards is trying to is trying to put forward in the latest errata for dungeons and dragons and when people call out how dumb this is the argument is it's just it's just a lore it's just an optional lore change why are you so mad well, the 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 counter argument is, of course, if it's just if it's just if it's just a optional lore change, and it and and it can be it can be interpreted how people wish. Why is it in there to begin with? Why do you, why do you need why do you need it to be in there? It's one of those things where you can't have it both ways. And hypocrites will always expose themselves. Yep. But I but in. But even with even within this, I'd say th I'd say this is as good as a spot to any to tra to transition over into a a uh, mantra that we've hinted at tonight, but we haven't gone all the way into, and that is fans, not fandom. Which it could it could easily it could easily be argued that the two of them are are one and the same, and we're splitting hairs. There is a very clear difference. It boils down to the differences between individualism and collectivism. Fans... Chris, actually, hold that thought. Because okay. I think I have a very easy way to describe how this ends up. We're going to take a quote from the 1997 classic Men in Black. People are smart. They can no, handle a, things. A, a person is smart. Oh no, a person is smart. People are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it. Yeah. Fans are individuals. They like a thing. They like to share their enthusiasm about that thing. And they like to share it with other people who may have that enthusiasm, other fans, or people who don't know or don't have that enthusiasm. People outside of that fan base. And as I said earlier, I dis I deliberately use fan base over fandom mm -hmm. because a fan base is just a base of fans. 
That's got to be pretty loud during the summer. <clears throat> <laughs> a fandom is a collective. It, it is people who have bought into an identity of a group. And that is why it is a singular noun. Fandom. Even referring to multiple people. These are people who, for better or worse, have, instead of keeping their individuality, thrown in with the mob, and in so doing, are influenced by that mob. Uh, there are people who are part of fandom that are treated worse than other people within the same fandom mm -hmm. because they try to throw out individual arguments, individual thoughts, individual critiques, and the fandom comes rushing down on them. No, you don't do that. People, People's experiences within the fandom are all valid. You can't make that critique. You can't say that thought. You can't have that voice. You must be the voice of the mass. You cannot be the voice for yourself. And this expands into a personal philosophy of mine about how collectivism is fucking evil, but uh, that's for an entirely different discussion. Yeah. I've some of you some of you may recall that I've I've frequently brought up the Inquisitor's question and the the question of the Vorlons throughout um throughout Babylon five. But specifically how it's used in the episode Comes the Inquisitor. That question is, who are you? And in con in context, when he's gr when he's when the Inquisitor is grilling Delenn about that question, she gives she gives him her name. He says that is unacceptable because he already knows that. He gives the f he gives the f he gives her um her ge her geniality, that is also unacceptable. He ge he gives her, he gives her he gives her he gives her job as an as ambassador that is also unacceptable. And of course, of course, each time it's unac and unacceptable, she ends up getting shocked due to the manacles she had to wear. And throughout it, he's basically beating into beating into her that you that one you are you and your and the idea of of you being destined for for some great cause is nothing but is nothing but a fallacy. A lot of the answers that she gave at the at the outset of that Inquisition mm -hmm. were titles. They were labels, things bestowed upon her, or things she claimed for herself, but were not who she is. Mm -hmm. And answering who you are is actually a really hard question for a lot of people. Um, don't if if you're starting to turn this this whole thing in your head after this example, um, good actually. Getting you to think is part of what Geek Watch is for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but who you are is not a question that can be adequately answered, to be honest. And that was also the Inquisitor's point, I think. Yeah. Especially, especially, especially since, well, he, well, the revelation at the the revelation at the end of at the end of it is the, is the fact that he is essentially judging people for the same for the same um, vices that he fell he fell into hundreds of years ago because his real identity and spo spoilers for for spoilers for an almost for an almost twenty year old show. Um, so way outside of the clause, monk. Yeah, no need for a spoiler is, alert. The Inquisitor's real identity is Jack the Ripper. Some someone who, in his, in his mind, he saw himself as the, as this divine messenger to try and reform to try and reform the decadence he was seeing in London. Then the Vorlons met him, and he and he was quickly learned of how small he actually is in the grand scheme of things. And, the, this... and thus he and thus he was given the, he was given the job of Inquisitor. <laughs> if you ever want to know how insignificant you are from a fa from a, like a pure nonfiction standpoint, go look at the picture of the pale blue dot. Go listen to Carl Sagan talk about it. Mm -hmm. 
our home a mote of dust hung in a sunbeam? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gale kind of matters. Yeah. But the <laughs> but the point the point with this is that it bad a common tactic of bad actors is this idea that you have to you have to behave or believe in a certain way otherwise you are not, otherwise you are not part otherwise you are not part of the group. Um we see we see this often in cer in certain groups where they ha where you have to have a certain belief um or you or you're not part or you're not part of it. Um uh, basically basically weaponizing the comfort of being within a group against against the, against the against those that would be that are deemed undesirable. And fandom is just as susceptible to this if it do, if it does not if it does not self police. Because so when it gains that quality of fandom mm -hmm. that that that's when it becomes fandom when the tribalism is weaponized and used that way yes yeah and i'd say i'd say when it comes to the more t when it comes to the when it comes to the um toxic elements we've seen with undertale and a few others the the weaponization is the is the idea of, is the idea of um of pe of people de of people demanding to maintain that promised utopia that pro that promise of you are you are n of all of all these AUs and all these OCs and all these fa all these head cannons being just as valid oh and gr now granted I'm looking at that from an outside looking in perspective but I'm pretty I wouldn't be surprised if there if there were some stories of some of somebody not a, having the slightest disagreement on so, on someone's AU, and getting and getting threatened of of being run off because of that. Um. Oh, I can do you one better than that, because the community the communities behind a lot of these AUs got so bad. You remember those first two I brought up, Underfell and Underswap? Yeah. Yeah, their original creators eventually had to just give up their AUs and let the community just run with it because. They couldn't handle the amount of overwhelming insanity that was coming from it. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, Vic the uh, Vic the Underfella did eventually come back to to kind of reintegrate into his into the Underfella uh, community, but Popcorn Prince, nah, they've never returned. They're gone, they and they that is not an isolated incident. Mm -hmm. I um, I've cer I've certainly seen my fair share of that with. With with um with my own neck of the woods, um give, given uh, given given the especially given the fact that the, that I have been so I have done I have done something so villainous as have a conversation with people that someone doesn't like. Yeah, and uh, in the world of video games, with many fan games that are created hourly. There have been numerous occasions of people from a fandom. I'm looking at you, compilation of Final Fantasy VII fandom. Oh, am I looking at you? Fuck you guys. Um, who, you make a small suggestion about tiny things. You're immediately persona non grata. And anyone who might agree with you joins you in the pit. Um, it is fucking insane because it's a fucking video game, guys. <laughs> as much as I love video games and I get into them and they're super good and entertaining and there are just some great games out there, play Super Robot Wars 30, uh, there are... Going that far... For a piece of fiction, because someone said something you didn't like, is mind-bogglingly missing the point. This oh, you don't like what, my... Sorry, go ahead. You don't like what they you don't like what they said. Go play the fucking video game again. Who cares what they said? Play the game. 
Oh, and, and Zan, it does. I can expand this even further because there's a, there's a couple other communities out there that have this exact same problem, and I'm referring to the Toku community, both Japanese and Western. You know Good what? Somebody said, "Go watch the shows again." There's the <laughs> point. Yeah, no, you're not wrong, but it happens. You know, someone makes an I someone suggests something about a show that the fandom has decided is bad. Good God, do you get railed on? I'm trying to I'm trying to think of a specific example on both on both ends of on both ends of the Pacific. Oh, <laughs> oh. Well, I, I'm more referring to the fact that Western Toku fans, regarding whether it be the Japanese Toku or Ameritoku, mm -hmm. because. Both the Common Rider slash Sentai and the Power Rangers fan ba fandoms, they are both toxic as fuck. I can. Hell, I Lord can, knows, uh, Lord knows, Zeltrax Millennium over there has had to deal with his fair share of that. After we've told him numerous times to just stay out of that shit. <laughs> yeah, I um, I haven't I haven't had to deal with that I haven't had to deal with that all that often. But I think it I think it's because of the fact that I don't. I do. I don't. In, I don't engage in a whole lot of in a whole lot of fan community forums or or the like, unless unless I'm lurking. Mostly because mostly because I lear I learned my I learned my lesson after my set of incidents with RPG.net. Hey monk. Yeah. Guess what we're gonna have to deal with when FF Legend is finished. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, we're gonna have to. We're getting it. We're getting it two ways. We're gonna have to deal with the grogs, and we're probably gonna have to deal with the. We're gonna have to deal with the with the with the folks who, for whom say FF Seven is the only game that they have, and they'll be yelling at us about the fact that we didn't um, put in a materia system, or didn't include soldier as a track. Um, yeah, which which in, which in that in that case. Um, if we if we nope. end up getting anything like that, I'm considering doing what what um the developer of Kill Puppies for Satan does, and, po <laughs> and posting up all and posting up all of our hate mail, and in the point and laugh section. I <laughs> I think we should do that anyway. <laughs> That's just that. here, here. Allow me to get the ball rolling to these to these FF Seven uh, fan fan tards. Hey guys, six is better. Fuck you. Fight me. <laughs> As easy as he, as um low as, hanging fruit. I mean, it is just seven fans. Yeah, low hanging, yeah, that low hanging fruit. But let let me let me raise the stakes on that. Um, the the compilation fan the compilation fandom who who are too attached. I would sooner play all the bravest than put up with you. <laughs> you know what? I'll go. I'll go one further, monk. Well, you would rather oh, watch FF Unlimited? FF Unlimited is good. Fuck off. <laughs> but no. Um, to all of you compilation fags out there, I would rather play Four Warriors of Light than, uh, than deal with you. And that is mired in microtransactions. You want to unlock the next warrior in your army? Just like in all the bravest? Money. Mm -hmm. <sighs> now that that being that being said that being said when it the bi the the other bi the other big issue when it comes when it comes to fandom that we that we end up having is the is the fact that there, there's this, there's this idea, there's this almost exclusivity idea that I often see within um, fandoms, where you have to be a fan of that one thing and little else. Which you can't be a fan of Undertale and and Final Fantasy at the same time. I would, I would see that, I would see this quite a bit during that, during the really, really retarded um, JRPG versus WRPG debate. And I would especially see it from pe from people who who um who re who had a who had a Napoleon complex about 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 um quote unquote JRPGs. Um, 
and even even more, so, I would even I would see it even more so in the seventh generation, if you if you had anything positive to say about shooters. Monk, all you make me want to do now is arrange a uh, arrange a war between compilation of FF Seven fandom and Bethesda fandom. Um, I'd be lying if I said I di I said I didn't. I didn't start. I didn't start a fandom fight at a con years ago. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I specifically want to start it between these two groups, just for the fuck of it. Um. <sighs> I um, I, I ended up, I ended up starting a war between between um, Tol between Tolkien fans and Harry Potter fans a long, <laughs> long time ago. <laughs> <sighs> Damn! Oh <laughs> uh, my god! Bas I basically had I basically I basically had a had a bunch of had a bunch of alts that I that I used to that I used to stir shit up between two between two between two sites. Then then set up a voice chat with with both sides of it and let and um it wasn't it wasn't until everybody started shouting that I just that I just, that I just went everybody you just got played. <laughs> uh... Monk, you're an evil bastard. That's why we love you. <laughs> uh, and this, and it's not, it's not the first time. It's not the first time I've done those kind of stunts because I've, I've made it clear that I have a very, I have, I have quite the fondness for the SoCal hoax. And, th and, th and the whole dihydrogen monoxide, which I've told that story, but. <laughs> you, but if, but um, whenever it comes to, I'd say whenever it comes to this idea of having to defend one one's quote unquote fandom, um, the, there's a few there's a few prob there's a few pitfalls that can easily fall into one, um, don't don't sim don't sim for a million do don't sim for multi million dollar corporations because you're not gonna get a check out of that. <laughs> um, and we've we've made it clear the eleventh commandment: Thou shalt not simp. <laughs> well, except for a, except for a certain Frankenstein girl, she can do that all she likes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I dare you to try to stop her. Let me know how that goes. No, I um, I know I know bet I know better than to try than to try and swim up river without a paddle. <laughs> He likes to keep his arms as well. Yes, yes. But the other, the other, um, the other thing, the other thing about the other thing about it is, it's is that it's ve it's very, at the at the same time, don't be don't be passive on the matter because if somebody if somebody has a bad t if somebody has a bad take, don't critique them because they had a bad take about something you're a fan of. Have them critique them because they made a bad fucking take. Yeah. Critique the thing that needs to be critiqued, and, if, and also, and if need be, oh. point and laugh at the idiot. Yeah, laughter is the best way to kill bad ideas. Remember, um, Nazism was almost dead in the eighties. You could laugh at even it, uh, on it on even on movies like the Blues Brothers. I hate and Illinois now, Nazis. <laughs> goddamn Illinois Nazis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh. Also remember that bad takes can include straight up just malicious attacks. Mm -hmm. And if someone is making a straight up malicious attack, you critique the take and you critique the action. Because they're both bad things. Oh. The th but but um the thing the th it's also important to recognize when when someone's when someone's doing an outright troll job, um, or taking a page out of my playbook for better. And usually, worse. if you're paying enough attention, you can usually tell the difference. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, usually. sometimes it's not even important to know the difference. If someone is making a natural, a naturally malicious attack or something they think is a malicious attack, and you can try to spin it as a troll job or bait. It completely defangs them. Mm -hmm. Throw up a "is this bait" meme or 
uh, by the bait of my bone or any of your other funny bait, uh, bait comics, which are always relevant and people have stopped posting them and I don't know why. <sighs> so as I pray, unlimited bait works. Exactly. <laughs> unlimited bait works. This is low quality bait and it's in uh, 240p JPEG. Yeah. Um, Yay. The he's not even trying anymore where, where, the, where it says not bait on the hook. Yep. <laughs> or um, there's just there's numerous very uh, variations. I think one of my favorite ones that was politically relevant just a couple years ago was uh, <laughs> MBGA make bait great again. <laughs> I can't even be mad at that one, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> it was a fish with a Trump toupee on too. <laughs> But when it com when it comes to the other thing when it comes to um, when it comes to fandom is the fact that when you have when you have that sort when you have that sort of you ne needing to defend or needing to be wired all the time like that you and you end up being vi you end up being vinegar with flies because the because the because um somebody who's com somebody who's coming in and becoming an enthusiast of that same thing will look at will look at you guys and go. I don't want to fuck with you guys. Yep, and the Undertale fan base has had that problem where people have just people have just said they would not even touch the game because they're like, I don't want to even be associated with the fan that kind of fan base, mm -hmm. that kind of fandom. Uh, I remember I remember a few years ago in Mandalore's um, Planet Side Two, not not Planet Side Two video in his um, in his Star Citizen video that he did. He had he had talked to, he had talked about how a, how a lot of the how a lot of the fan base was get was getting culty in terms of in terms of critique, and his comparison. Well, oh God! I saw. God damn it, <laughs> um, in the council, my favorite bait picture, by the yeah. way. Um, <laughs> his his partic what he had, he had said he had said that for anybody who anybody who was. Anybody who had anything critical to say would have to go through this embar embarrassing, li embarrassing qualifier preamble before before going through it. And he made a comparison with his experiences with Planet Side Two, where he said, "Where if he if he felt one of the if he felt one of the rifles was overpowered, he'd po he'd post up, hey, I think hey, I think this I think this rifle might be OP. Any any thoughts? Whereas whereas if he were to do it in the in the Star Citizen version of it's the case, we'd have to go." Hi everyone. I'm I've been I've been a long-time supporter of of Planet Side 2 for many years and I love it very much. I've enjoyed I've enjoyed I've enjoyed most of my experience, but I think I think the car might be over, might be overpowered. Long live Planet Side 2. And Ugh. if if you think that's an isolated incident, I had to deal with this exact same shit in 2008 during the during the early during the early wave of um D&D 4th edition. Where if if you said anything positive, you had to you had to put you had to go. It was almost like you had to go through this whole thing of your G, of your GM experiences with an with an ending point of I know what I'm talking about. I even brought this up in a past video because I I saw that more I saw that way too many times when people had anything that wasn't negative to say about it. Yeah, I I really cannot stand this idea that you have to be. At a certain level of knowledge, expertise, and understanding before you can criticize something. No, if you have a legit issue with some, with uh, with the product, you speak up. Mm -hmm. uh, these days, I, these days I end up here. I end up hearing. I end up hearing a few, a few repeat, a few repeat excuses whenever whenever I've been whenever I've been critical of fifth edition. Um, I've had one. I've had one person say that the reason I'm critical of um, of critical role is jealousy, which is absolutely hilarious. Um, I can assure you that's nowhere in it. There's no jealousy in this man's blood. No. And the, and and that that whole thing started when I when I said that I had when I said that as I've said to you in the past, I have I have concerns for its long term effect on the hobby. Not that, not that I, not that I have any issues w with the show itself or anybody involved, anybody involved with it, unless they make, unless they make it an issue. 
I just I just th I just think that I just think that I'm I'm seeing a problem I'm seeing a problem brewing and I don't think enough people were talking about it so I did. And I'm for and within the within within that within that kind of thing it was there's there's usually there's, there were usually a few repeat lines that people would give as apo as apologetics and I'd always just laugh it off because well if well if you're giving me the same line I've heard a dozen times already then you don't have much interesting to say to me um but I'm pretty I'd be, I'd actually be a bit I'd actually be a bit curious if there were some people who who were sh who were shouted down about the essentially episodic um um setup for Delta Rune. Uh, I didn't see anything to that effect. I think most people understood that, you know, it, it, Toby Fox made it clear that this was something he had a lot of things planned for. So, but there was so much considering he had to live up to what Undertale was that creating something that this thing was not going to be something he could just do in one game. Mm -hmm. And eventually he will release a full finished product. He's already put up a Steam page where it's going to ha where the first few chapters are available to play for free, but I'm sure once he's done he's going to polish it up, add a few some some flair and some touches to it and then release it as a as a paid product. Mm -hmm. You know, that seems to be the game plan and most of the fan base is pretty okay with that. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly so. Um, uh, when it comes when it comes to when it comes when it comes to fa when it comes to the to um fa to fandom, I'd say I'd say I'd say another I'd say another another tr another trap that can that can that can be f that can be fallen into is the is the is the idea that um that just be that just because you're an expert means that you means that means that it means that people have to listen to you oh because I have that's something I that's something I have is I have seen in, in other cases where because where because somebody had some sort of achievement that that means that th that um that they, that essentially that they end up getting a big ego could be one issue mm -hmm. yeah oh it's there's a lot there's a lot of <sighs> There's a lot of traps in, involved with um, f with fandom because fandom is an identity, whereas f whereas being a fan of something is just a is just an aspect. And if you let if you, I I give I gave this I gave this warning. To to cer to certain fan groups I've give, I've um I remember, the right opinion giving this warning to Storytime animators at one point. And that is when you live as a collective, you die as a collective. I think I think I even brought that up during the V Shoujo drama. Yeah, probably. And the re this is this is why it's important to police and as much as people are gonna get mad at me for saying this, gatekeep. I am fully I'm fully aware that there that that um a lot of people have the have this idea that gatekeeping is synonymous with elitism. Which isn't the case. No. <clears throat> gatekeeping the problem is yeah, I think you and I are on a similar bait wave. A lot of people think when they hear the word gatekeeping, they th they have this idea that oh, we only allow those we choose to join us. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not what that is. Gatekeeping is more of, okay, you were interested in this? You're legitimately interested? Come on in. Doesn't matter. Wait, you just want to spread your shit? Get the fuck out of here. We don't need your shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's I'm, gatekeeping. Yeah, and I will fully admit that I, get, that I gatekeep the temple because you you guys know if I even smell somebody um, um, more interested in spreading their particular bullshit, I th they get thrown out with prejudice. And probably yes. get their name written in the book. Hell, indeed. Hell, without naming names, we actually—you actually had to do that very recently. Mm -hmm. Without naming names, I think he did that to himself. That—that's the point. <laughs> he, <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I mean, Monk only knocked him down a peg. He didn't kick him out of the temple. He—he he removed himself from the temple. Mm -hmm. Well, 
point still stands. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the 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 point I was going to expand on there is when you properly keep a gate. Look at the function of an actual gate for a second. A gate is a point of admittance for people who are authorized and have an interest in the area that the gate enters into. Uh, a gate in front of your house only allows the people you want to be guests inside your house because otherwise no one should have interest. Mm -hmm. A gate in front of a park only allows those who have a legitimate interest in the park and only during times of, uh, of if they have hours, the, the hours of the park. Um, gates are used to keep out elements that have no legitimate interest or worse are people feigning a legitimate interest in order to become bad actors within whatever community the gate keeps mm -hmm. um, there's a funny quote that's been going around yet again because of the gatekeeping argument coming up once again uh, um, attributing a quote to Genghis Khan of uh, the people who are upset about gates are those who uh, that they are made for, <laughs> which is which obviously Genghis Khan did not actually say something like that. It's mm -hmm. it's made to be funny, mm -hmm. but uh, when when we speak on gatekeeping, we want to keep people out of the hobby who are only looking to get into the hobby to inject their own personal. Uh, their own personal ethos, their own personal ideals, and change the hobby fundamentally. There is a, a comic I saw a while back that I found really good called The Degradation of a Hobby um, that essentially hobbies start with people who are interested in the hobby, whatever it might be, whether it's tabletop, video games, anime, etc., they they share this interest. Mm -hmm. This is this is this is when fans start being a thing. Individuals who have the same interest have the same enthusiasm for that interest. And they start then inviting others into that hobby or fan base. People who share a similar interest, but maybe not the same exact interest, such as, you know, we both really like anime, but maybe you're not in fully into mecha yet. Watch some mecha with me. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. That's an example of moving within a subgenre. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you know what? Actually, I'm going to throw out a good reference point. One that I normally would not recommend people watch because it's not the greatest, but in terms of making the point we're trying to make when it comes to why gatekeeping needs to be a thing, I'd like to refer you to a certain episode of Doctor Who. And I'm pretty sure the two of you already know where I'm going with this. Please no. Hey, <laughs> hey, I'll straight up say it. It's a bad episode. But it does make the point very solid. And that episode is Love and Monsters. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Allow me to quantify my statement for those who don't understand what I'm getting at. Yeah. The whole idea behind Love and Monsters was... This one guy had been had had interactions with the doctor and was trying to look up more about it and found out there was a group of people who were also trying to look into the doctor. They all kind of formed this fun little fan group. Then they, you know, on top of just looking up the doctor, were having doing other things, you know, having some hobbies on the side that they were all doing. And it was a lot of fun. Then this one alien decides to come in and interject himself in the group, takes it over and basically forces them to work to their work their asses off just strictly on the doctor, and then also starts absorbing them because he's a, a butt ugly ass alien called Absorbaloff. But that's that's a whole other thing altogether, and that's where the episode completely falls to shit. <laughs> and I feel bad for the kid who designed that creature too, because it was a contest entry. But. In terms of the point we're making here when it comes to toxic people and gatekeeping, that part of the episode really sh does make that point very fucking clear. That there are people who will come in and push their own ideals, push their own agendas. And those are the people you want to keep out because if you let them in, everything falls apart.
and and it isn't always uh, obvious. Is the other point I was getting at. Um, That's true. In fact, it usually starts with good intentions. Like I said, the the core group of the fan base or the hobby are all doing this because they're enthusiastic about it. They invite people who have a tangentially related uh, interest in things that are similar, but not necessarily the same. Mm-hmm. Again, we both like anime. You may not yet be into into mecha. Come watch some mecha with me. It's going to be cool. Um, then you start getting the friend of a friend cascade, essentially. You have the core group invited their close friends that aren't yet part of the core group in to experience the same thing. Those people then invite people from even further out who have a tangentially related interest to their tangentially related interest to your core group. And you can start to see how the degrees of separation may start causing problems if you can't solidify A, the core group, and B, the connections between the core groups and the tangentially related members. You need to rise, you need to to cause the interest to rise to a point where even somebody pulled in from a friend of a friend is going to be just as enthusiastic as the core group, because that means they're going to be interested in preserving that core group. Because otherwise, you start to get out further and further into tangent land, and somebody with almost no interest in whatever the core is at this point Mm -hmm. Uh, through the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. I mean, six degrees of separation comes in and wants to change the core to suit their tangential relation. And if enough of them come in, if enough of them are pulled into that point, they will subvert the fan, the fan base. They will subvert the hobby and become fandom. And I'd say I'd, I'd say for for my for my own experience, um, in the tabletop realm, the the um ga- the games that have the games that have really fa- that have really fallen into that are entries are in, the big entry that re- that really fell into this trap was fate. The whole and gr- granted, um. Evil Hat Studios certainly didn't help matters by by ex- mm-hmm. by accelerating the process. What with what with what with some of the really terrible product that they were putting out, and the and the fact that the the fact that their um ser- their communications were less than stellar. Um, to a lesser degree, powered by the apocalypse, cer- certainly ended certainly ended up aiding this. But I do find it I do find it kind of amusing that a lot of the a lot of the more to- a lot of the more toxic communities um always end always end up with games that on that are on um itch instead of drive through rpg or someplace else not all of them but a fair amount of them is the reason why what is the reason why i don't i um i wouldn't look at a whole lot of rpgs on it on itch compared mm-hmm. to, compared to other sites that i sc- that i scour for info and possible interviews Again, not a, not every not every um not every game not every RPG on itch is guilty of this, but there's there's some that are. Yeah. The I think the best point here about some of if we're looking at both sides of the spectrum, fandoms that do self police properly and keep toxicity to a minimum. Because you're never going to get rid of toxicity. There's always going to be that guy. Mm-hmm. They always exist. Yeah. yeah. And then the fandoms that do nothing to police anything of worthwhile note and police only the people that, that, that are trying to keep a semblance of reason. The, the, the big difference between the two is something who... Something that a lot of people call... The paradox of tolerance. Oh yeah, I'm fi- I'm very familiar with this. Where, in the name of tolerance, you become tolerant to all things, including intolerance. Um, I personally think the paradox is kind of stupid, because 
it's very clear if you're using a modicum of brain cells, which might be the problem in this case. Most people who preach tolerance are themselves secretly out of brain cells and tolerance. <clears throat> um, is that, yes, tolerate everything within reason. What is within reason, you might ask? Well, does it still contain the enthusiasm and well-meaning wishes of the people creating something without deconstructing other people? Not, that, not necessarily their projects. Again, critique is good. It can help to improve things if you're critiquing in the proper fashion. But attacking a person directly, not not ever almost ne almost never necessary i mean there are there are points where sometimes a person is being that guy so you attack them as that guy mm -hmm. um and you 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 make sure that the core of that enthusiasm is intact if somebody starts attacking that core the core of that enthusiasm and I'm going to use an example that, while Monk and I no longer play this series with really any amount of regularity re regularity at this point, um, is an example of someone coming in and trying to subvert the core. The time people got bitchy about the word race in D&D. &D. Or, oh. or even more recently... Um, all the D&D &D 5 errata that is getting fucking panned right now. <laughs> yeah, it it's getting it's shades it is getting so panned that the higher that the guy, the guy who's running things in the D&D &D division at Hasbro came out with a statement saying that people need to reread the thing and, and effect, effectively errata the errata. Man, there are some people saying some uh <laughs> There, there are some people saying some uh, some fun things about the the errata as well, uh, but that's beside the point. the The point is, someone like the the core. We don't actually care about the word race. It's been there for forever, so people are just going to use it as shorthand anyway. Mm -hmm. Call it an ancestry. Call it your bloodline. Call it your call it whatever the fuck you please. We don't care. What we care about was that somebody was trying to affect a pointless change where it was unnecessary and it was for a personal agenda and not on an on an honest well-meaning attempt to improve the core of the hobby it was very clear that this was a personal agenda for these people who kept saying it. Mm -hmm. yeah um and let's, that's let's, that's let's where it, it all uh comes together mm -hmm. that there are people who are going to make dumb suggestions. It happens. I've made dumb suggestions. Monk has made dumb suggestions. Shades has made dumb suggestions. We all do it throughout our lives. Yeah. We may mean well making such a su suggestion because we're trying to legitimately throw something out there that sounds cool, want to do something with it that sounds fun, and then people go, nah, that's kind of dumb. And you, and you look at it a little more and you go, yeah, I can see how that's kind of dumb. I should probably improve the, the suggestion before I throw it out again. Yeah. And that, that's gatekeeping too, technically, at that point. But you're not completely kicking the person out. You're just saying, hey, hey, that idea on the surface sounds cool, but look at how it's going to be dumb down the road. And it gives you a chance to reflect and, and reconsider. Yeah. It's a case of, hey, you know what? You got the right idea, but let's see. You know, but might want to go back and tweak a little bit. Yeah. So it all it all circles back to the difference between giving... Constructive criticism and feedback, being and being willing to take it, and being willing to call out the bad actors. Those two things are the essence of gatekeeping, in a positive, non-elitist um, fashion, which what most people are afraid of is the elitism argument. Mm -hmm. You want to see bad gatekeeping? Go watch the OSR. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's a reason why "fuck the grogs" is a is a common statement. Oh, here. <laughs> it's the it the same the same reason what the same reason why um why for why um there is a cer there is a certain segment in the in the 
when it comes to when it comes to enthusiasts of FF6 that I have made it clear that I do not care for. And yeah. I'm, I'm supposed to, and this it's not something that's that's some um, exclusive to that because I have this exact same problem with people who um unnecessarily compare and compare any game after Ocarina of Time to Ocarina of Time including Majora's Mask which is why that game got a whole lot of shit until it until in recent years where it got a better um reevaluation um Tales of Sim Tales of Symphonia is definitely a is definitely a case of this kind of thing to the point, to the Tales point of where... Symphonia is a good game, but uh... the quality yeah. the quality of the game the quality of the game is is not the is not the point issue. Getting at. Yeah, it's, I know. Yeah, no, we people, know. It's people unnecessarily comparing what came afterwards to it. Or it's setting it. a bar that doesn't need to be there. Mm -hmm. And the and of course, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the resentment I have with the. With the Castlevania should be Egovania exclusively attitude. Even hey, I'm a fan of the Egovanias, but even I can say, you know what? It's it, if you could do it right, a good change wouldn't hurt. Yeah, yeah. and even Ega would not say something like that. Mm -hmm. There's no yeah. fucking way. Yeah, but that but that was something that I that was something that we talked about on the Castlevania episode that I mentioned I resented. Especially during the during the early, during the early months of the first Lords of Shadow, yeah, because people were comparing it to 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 a standard it had no desire of uh, of um following. Yeah, you can't you can't uh you can't hold an action puzzle game because there are there are actually some pretty decent puzzles in Lords of Shadow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Apple to a action exploration game yeah um i'd say th there's there's a con there's a concept that i've referred to known as the sweet rifle a, ter a term that i took from a short story i read as a kid for, by gary paulson called the rifle and god re god rest his soul since he sadly passed away a few months ago yep um the sweet a sweet rifle as the story goes, was a rifle that was that was of such quality that the gun that a gunsmith could only make one of them in his life. And of course, an of course, another phrase for this kind of thing is magnum opus or the great work for the, for those who are familiar with alchemy, including myself. But. <laughs> to, to get something something of equal value must be given, monk. You're doing that as revenge for last Friday, aren't you? No, not at all. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing, but the thing, the thing of it is, is that obviously, though, obviously, those masterpieces can't be replicated. And trying to trying to expect trying to expect someone to, the the follow up to reach that standard is setting yourself up for disaster. But to br to bring this back around, when it comes to the curse of fandom, there's a lot. There's a lot of. I don't mean to. I do not mean to say to say that you need to abandon all fa need to abandon all fandom and disassociate or anything like that. No, no. That w that is that is ju that is just as extreme as as being as being in a fan dumb. What I what I the point that I do want to get at is to exercise caution. When it comes to groups, and if if the, if if the, if um if it starts to be all about uh, all about attacking and people being that level of defensive, leave, because I get I guarantee I guarantee you your ta your talents will be able to find their footing elsewhere, even if you're outside a given a given Reddit or a given forum. Or and especially especially since it's not that hard to to build to build your own identity. Outside of those groups, hell, we've done it here. Mm -hmm. But I think, but I think, I think that is a strong enough capstone for th for this particular episode. This was a shorter one, but that's sim that's simply because there's 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 the um fo the ground to cover isn't as vast, and also 
I guess you could consider I guess you can consider this a bit of the cooldown before we get to the shit next week. Something that nah. is not letting is not is probably staring daggers at me about. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, monk. Bullshit. Mm. <laughs> but so I'm just saying we nuke it from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. Well, where's the fun in that? But anyway, um, next Tuesday, next Tuesday, I will be putting up an interview with Adam Myers since he's doing an expansion on the always awesome Spheres of Power system, um, as well as well as once as well as a advanced engineering book, because we solve practical problems. Um, Wednesday, <laughs> I'm gonna be I'm going to hopefully be doing the interview with um J with James Streisen that I planned for last week, but Mother Nature had other ideas. Thunder, thunderstorm ended up mess ended up messing with our connectivity. Um, next Thursday, we will because much like how we did the the E three Hangover watch party, we will be doing a we will be doing a fuck fuck the video game awards, um, on a on a similar vein, just going through just going through some of the reveals and the like that ha that happened, along along with a few other things that. Ended up getting ended up getting announced or talked about around the same time, but were overlooked by the by the usual suspects. Um, I will there will there will probably not be a Valley of the Judge episode being being put up on the tw on Christmas Eve because I'm pretty sure Zan is going to be hammered. How <laughs> about that one? I might get hammered for Geek Watch though. <laughs> um, on the I I will note that some um, I will there will be another episode of the Monk and Monarch coming. I'm gonna I'm gonna be taking I'm going to be recording that um, on the 26th, but it's pro but it's probably not going to be out for a few weeks because he's going to be doing some editing on that. Um, but next week for the last Geek Watch of 2021, we will we will be doing one last reconstruction. The target, Sword Art Online, because we're because with all with all with all the attempts at at um fi at fixing Mary Sue characters that we've had over the years, I figure we may as well tackle the white whale that is Jesus Coon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, even I might be able to have some fun with this one. I will note that with that one, we are only tackling the Ironcrad arc. Yeah, you kind of have to tackle these at uh, one arc at a time because they each come with their own sets of shit. That and the Ironcred arc feels feels like it's the mo feels like it's a, it can be a very self-contained affair. Plus, someone else has already kind of done their own reconstruction of the uh, Fairy Dance arc. Hmm. Who? Mother's Basement, believe it or not, that was one of his earlier videos. Oh, that that explains why I didn't see it. <laughs> but with but um, with all that said as al as always a sincere thanks to everyone who took the t who took the time to vi who visit the te who visit our particular temple and enjoy the madness that comes around here um i hope i hope i hope so i hope some of you got the got the chance to enjoy the cogent unimpressions um i will ha i will have the role playing bubble um using coming up Probably, in, probably in the next few weeks. Probably be in early January when that comes down. And I and I will be bringing up that allegory of the cave Im image that I, that I found a few weeks back. <laughs> but until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk, and join the watch. <laughs> <laughs>